Welcome to Central News, I'm Hilary Entwistle. In today's news, restoring the integrity and quality of the Waipa River will be managed by a new Iwi Crown co-management arrangement, the first of its kind in New Zealand. The councils involved in the new agreement with Ngāti Manaia Poto, uh, Otorohanga District Council, Waikato District Council, Waikato Regional Council, Waipa District Council and the Waitomo District Council. Chairman Peter Buckley for the Waikato Regional Council says this joint venture is necessary for strengthening the ties with iwi to help protect our rivers. The um, iwi and their um, treaty settlement with the uh, Crown made it necessary. That, that was, um, it was mandated into the treaty settlement that we actually did this. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's important for the uh, Crown and also for iwi to actually have this put into place to actually clean up, you know, to look at the water quality. And that's all issues that relate into the water quality. Uh, that's from sediment to nitrates to whatever's in the water quality. So it, we were mandated to do that. A high-powered forum held in China last week has the potential to benefit the wider Bay of Plenty's forestry industry as it seeks to position itself for increased trade with the Republic. The region's forestry sector was represented at last week's inaugural New Zealand-China Partnership Forum in Beijing, which brought together key figures from a range of sectors in China and New Zealand. Forestry and wood processing is a key focus area as part of Bay Connections aimed to develop global competitiveness, and the goal is to add value to more than 70% of the logs harvested in the region by 2020. Now for our region's weather for the weekend, Hamilton, your Saturday will have periods of rain with a northeasterly. Your expected high is 19 and an overnight low of 14. Saturday for you, Tauranga, will be raining with possible thunder. Your expected high is 20 and an overnight low of 16. Sunday for you, Hamilton, will have more rain and a northeasterly. Your expected high is 20 and an overnight low of 13. Tauranga, your Sunday will have periods of rain possibly heavy at times. Your expected high is 21 and an overnight low of 16. Just ahead, winning university students. Welcome to Central News on TV Central. A techno-savvy Waikato University team took out the title with an app designed to help parents read to their children more often. Amy caught up with some of the team to find out more on the competition. So, Urson, for those who don't know, what is the Ima Microsoft Imagine Cup competition? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, the Microsoft Imagine Cup is the world's premier software design competition. It brings together business students, graphic designers, programmers and people just with great ideas and then they take some time and they try and build a piece of software and then they present that software to a, a panel of executives and important people from the industry and then they're judged on their presentation and the product that they create. And Brian can you tell me a bit about your team who entered? Right, so the team um, consists of myself um, doing business, um, Urson um, here doing uh, programming, Marcel Beats also doing programming, and Shawnee Kitson who did the graphic design. So Urson, what was the task asked of each team? So we were entered in the innovation category, so we were building uh, an innovative piece of software and we chose to create an application for Windows 8. Can you tell me a bit about the app that you designed? Right, so what we've designed is a, an application called My Storyteller, which allows parents to record themselves reading a story to their child and send it to their child from across the internet. Now, Urson, where did you get the idea to create this app? So the idea for this app was a, a group effort, but it has a really interesting story in it um, from Brian's past. So Brian was in the military and he had the experience of not being able to spend as much time with his children as he wanted to. And this is a problem that he saw in a lot of uh, other families in the military. Um, one example of this was when Brian was uh, out at sea and he got to see his son crawl through Facebook for the first time. <laughs> so we developed this app to bring parents and children together. 
So did you face any challenges throughout the process? Sure, so um, this, is, this has been quite a, an interesting road for us. Um, over the course of this project we've had um, partners nearly die, um, people who have broken feet, um, cars that have blown up on the way to the competition and hardware failures at the last moment. But we've managed to overcome all those obstacles and win the innovation category so we're really proud. It sounds like you faced a, a lot of challenges over the way then. <laughs> So where did the final take place and how many teams were you competing against? So there were 500 odd teams who submitted a proposal for the Imagine Cup and they narrowed that down to 20 teams for the finals with four wildcard entries. So the 24 teams would present to the panel of uh, experts and then the next day we went through an exhibition where we would show uh, VIPs our app and then eventually have a prize giving at the Q Theatre in Auckland. And Brian, what was the competition like? Oh look, the competition was fantastic. Not only did we get a great opportunity to showcase some of our skills and abilities, but we got to meet with a whole bunch of other people who were doing the same thing. And some of the applications that were created from the competition were absolutely fantastic. And what was the category that you won? And tell me about the prize that you got to take home. We were in the innovation category. Um, there's very tough competition in this category as well, so that was really good. Um, in the end, we won uh, $4,000 to split between the team, but there's so much more that came out of this. It wasn't just the money, it was really the, the networking, the meeting people, and especially seeing the like-minded people who had been working really hard on a product. <laughs> so Brian, what happens now with the software? Right, so our, our intention is to continue developing this, this software. Um, it's kind of funny, we, we may have actually stumbled onto the goose that lays the golden egg in many ways. Uh, with the drive towards uh, weight, the weightless economy within New Zealand and, and the increasing push into the high tech sector, uh, we seem to have stumbled across an idea which has a huge potential for growth. And we've had a lot of interest from people in the community and in the business sector as well. And what guidance did you have over the process? Oh look, we've been incredibly lucky to have uh, a lot of support from all over the place. We had Lyndall Stewart from Business Mechanics who was our, our business mentor and she's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, we've had support from the Faculty of Computer and Mathematical Sciences here at Waikato as well as the Waikato Management School and the School of Education. So we've been really fortunate um, and we've also been really lucky to have family which has been really supportive as well. Yeah. So Urson, when, when might this app be available for general public to use? So we're hoping to release this app onto the Windows App Store before the competition in Russia, which is early June. Coming up next, the People's Inquiry. Welcome back. We spoke with Neville at the beginning of the year about the Glen Inquiry and Amy caught up with him again to get an update. Hi Neville. Now we spoke with you at the beginning of the year on this topic. So for those just tuning in, tell us what is the Glen Inquiry? The Glen Inquiry into domestic violence and child abuse is really a people's inquiry. As uh, many viewers will know, New Zealand has some pretty horrendous statistics when it comes to violence against women in the home and violence uh, against children. And so Owen Glenn is in a position in his life where he has the money to contribute to what he thinks are good causes, and this is one of them. His aim is to make it very much the people's inquiry, so we've got a website, gleninquiry.org.nz, where people can go online, uh, register their interest, come and tell us their stories. And from that and a uh, survey of the international literature, we hope to come up with a blueprint for ending uh, domestic violence and child abuse in this country, which we hope will, uh, political parties will take seriously in the lead up to next year's election. So can you update us as to what's been happening since we last spoke with you? So there's been a secretariat uh, set up, they've been busy uh, bringing together resources, the literature, assembling a uh, think tank, we've had, a, had one meeting, and now some of the hearings are beginning in various parts of the country where people can come along and meet with members of the think tank and tell their stories, their stories about what was problematic when they were experiencing domestic violence or child abuse, what helped, and their ideas for how to make our society free of domestic violence and child abuse. 
Tell us about the recent submission to the Family Court Reform Bill. Yes, that's an interesting one. It's kind of unfortunate that this reform of the family court is being pushed through at this moment. We think it would be much healthier if the government um, just held off and heard what the inquiry comes up with. We think it's premature to rush into this uh, series of reforms. And there's a whole number of reforms, but there are a couple, I think, that are really, really important. One is that it is intended to remove from the legislation what is commonly known as the Bristol Clauses. Now these are so named because um, in the early 90s a man called uh, Alan Bristol was given the custody of his children even though the court knew that he had been violent towards the children's mother Christine. And while they were in his custody he killed them and killed himself. The court believed that even though he had been violent to his partner, that he was an okay dad. And that, unfortunately, we have found to be quite a common mindset among far too many decision makers. There was an a, a inquiry conducted by Sir Ronald uh, Davidson, a former Chief Justice, and in his view, a rethink of the law was needed. And so these clauses require judges to investigate allegations of domestic violence and if they believe that there has been violence in the relationship then the judge cannot give unsupervised contact to the violent parent unless the judge is satisfied that the child is safe. That's really important because it is very clear that men who are violent to children's uh, mothers pose a really serious risk to the children. It's a risk of direct violence, it's a risk of intimidation, it's a risk of undermining what is needed for children who have been exposed to domestic violence to heal from the trauma of being witnesses uh, to that violence. So we think it is really important that those clauses are retained because without them, judges, too many judges have taken their eye off the ball and have put children in quite unsafe situations. And have you got any other concerns with the bill? Yes. The general thrust of it is to try and steer couples towards mediation in resolving disputes over childcare, rather than coming to court. Now, at first glance, that's a good idea. Most people would agree it's much better to get people around a table and have a civilised uh, discussion. The problem is that that's impossible if there has been violence. The, uh, the party who has been the victim, and 99 times out of 100 this is the woman, is likely to be intimidated, is likely to be fearful, will find it really difficult to uh, uh, speak up, and so any kind of mediation is really not that helpful. Now, the, to be fair to the government, they have a provision that cases that are identified as um, uh, involving domestic violence will be sidetracked away from that. But history would show that screening processes are not that great and that undoubtedly there will be uh, cases involving violence that will be steered down that mediation track. What's more, there is now going to be a provision that if a um, parent is found to be obstructive, then the judges could take that into account in awarding custody. And you can imagine if you are a woman and you're concerned about your children's safety, then you might think twice about raising those concerns. You might think twice about speaking up about the violence because the risk is that you might be seen as being obstructive and that could be used against you to put the children in the care of your abusive partner or, or ex-partner. That has a particularly chilling effect, I believe, and is really counter to the whole idea that the legislation ought to be guided by the principle of the best interests of the children. What that provision is doing is turning children into a pawn of the court used to punish parents rather than decisions being made on what is the best thing for the child. 
So what are your hopes on the outcome? Well, we would hope that the government pulls the bill out of Parliament in the time being, listens to the stories that are going to be collected over the next uh, few months, listens to what the inquiry comes up with, and then has a rethink. To find out more information, visit gleninquiry.org.nz. Coming up after the break, the new Civil Defence Service. If you have just joined us, welcome to Central News. A new Civil Defence Headquarters was opened on Tuesday in the Waikato to streamline the services. Amy caught up with the manager. Hi Lee. Now, what is new about the Waikato Civil Defence Group Emergency Coordination Centre? Uh, so previously the, the Group Emergency Coordination Centre was a multi-use room, it was um, shared with the rest of the regional council uh, offices, uh, so it meant that when we activated it required some moving around of equipment, we have to bring computers into the room, all these things add to the delay of the response. Um, however, to build a dedicated centre is, is also uh, quite challenging too. What we've done here is we've integrated our business as usual needs with an operational area so that we can activate almost immediately. Then if there's an actual activation, we know that if somebody walks in and sits down at that computer, it's ready to go, the printers are going to work, uh, and all the actual electronics that go along with that. Um, in addition, we have consolidated our staff in this one space, whereas before they were spread around the building, which obviously also enhances our capabilities as far as uh, how efficient we are in our response. And the other thing we've also done is try to look at ways to share resources there's several things within this building that are shared between us and other groups. It's primarily for businesses usual use of other groups, but if we need to, we can take them over very quickly. So for example, we have a training room with computers which are um, uh, 10 computers which are spread around the room for training purposes. But very easily we can walk in, plug in 10 phones and quickly turn that into a call center. And what was it before? The Group Emergency Management Office uh, only comprised of one full-time member of staff supported by a manager part-time and some administrative support uh, from within the WRC. Um, now today, because of the additional funding, we have seven full-time staff. So why were these changes instigated? Um, several years ago, uh, as a result of a capability assessment report by the Ministry of Civil Defence, we were found wanting in several places. Um, Fortunately, the, the uh, elected officials, uh, what we call a joint committee of civil defence, uh, got together and recognised there was uh, some improvements that were needed and uh, provided us the additional funding to get the additional staff. And also through the efforts of the Waikato Regional Council, we were able to establish this new uh, group emergency coordination centre. So what is a GEMO's role? So the Group Emergency Management Office is primarily here to administer the group as a whole. So the group is made up of uh, 11 councils to include the regional council and we uh, coordinate at a regional level. So each one of the councils are responsible for their own civil defence emergency management. Most of them have their own emergency operations centres. So what are the seven new full-time staff focusing on? Um, so firstly is my own position, um, I'm a dedicated controller. In the past that used to be a part-time position that was worked by a, maybe a senior manager off the edge of his desk or her desk. Um, now I'm, I'm the manager of the organisation and the full-time controller which allows me to dedicate a whole lot more time to the coordination that's required for that role. Uh, we have a programme manager over the entire team and then each one of the specialists within the team comprises of a training coordinator is responsible for coordinating training across the region. We also have what we call an information system coordinator. Uh, there's a lot of technology in civil defence today. Uh, in the old days it used to be whiteboards and pieces of paper. Now we rely more heavily on information systems and other notification technologies. So we have somebody on the team dedicated to administer that and also research new technologies that comes along. They're also responsible for helping the councils if there's actually any uh, uh, problems with their own uh, emergency management information. Uh, in addition, we have a what's called a Waikato Engineering Lifelines Group coordinator. That individual is responsible for administering that group that is made up with various different companies uh, and lifeline organizations such as gas, power, electricity. Um, 
in an act of, actual activation, their role will be slightly different. It's called a lifeline utility coordinator, in which case they're there to help coordinate between a civil defense environment and those companies during an actual event. The other half of that individual's job is also what we're calling business outreach, and that's to actually go out and meet all of the businesses and try and engage them more in civil defense. Um, and then finally, uh, we have an operations manager who's responsible for oversight of how we run our, our GEC, our Group Emergency Coordination Center. And finally, we have um, uh, an executive assistant that uh, helps the entire group. As you can imagine, we, we tend to generate a lot of administration. And who is funding this new uh, Group Emergency Coordination Center? The, the funding stream has, has changed slightly over the years. Each one of the councils used to contribute uh, towards, the, uh, towards the group. Uh, today, the regional council carries out all the funding on their behalf, so it's centrally administered. What is the group professional development strategy? So we're pretty excited about that. Um, we recognize there was a, a challenge. Everybody was being trained differently, not only in this region, but across the country. There is no national training standard in New Zealand for civil defense. And, and where that becomes a problem is if you need staff to support your EOC, uh, you can't draw them from anywhere else. Or if you do, you, you don't quite know what you're going to have coming through the door. Uh, we decided several years ago to generate a program that would standardize training across the region. Uh, also, uh, create uh, more professional training that was more targeted. Um, this was successful, so successful that a joining groups also decided they'd like to adopt the same strategy. I'm pleased to announce uh, within the last few weeks it's been uh, uh, recognized as a way forward by pretty much every group in the nation and we're hoping very shortly for it to become the standard. And how will the Group Emergency Coordination Centre make it easier uh, to facilitate things in a regional disaster? There's no one council or any one organisation that can really respond in a major disaster. The whole definition of a disaster is beyond your capabilities or resources. Um, so it's critical that we, we bring resources in from adjoining areas and you can only do that if it's done in a coordinated fashion. It also helps any duplication because you don't want uh, all councils reaching out for the same resources. We only have a finite amount. So our responsibility is primarily that coordination role to make sure that those that truly need it get the assets, um, uh, some prioritisation role. That is the news for today and this week. We really want you to be involved, so like us on Facebook and let us know your views. If you have news including your own video and photos, go to our website and hit upload. Thanks for joining us. I will be back next week with more guests from in and around the regions. I'm Hilary Entwistle. Have a lovely evening and a fantastic weekend. This has been an Alpha Media production, a division of Television Media Group. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.